We're live at Hogshead Cigar Lounge. Uh, we're getting ready to film Hops, Beans, and Leaf. I'm sitting here with Mr. Kevin Benedict from the Stafford Homebrew Club. I'm going to ask him a few questions about the club. <coughs> so how you doing, man? Good, you? Good. Awesome. So you're smoking that great big pipe you got going on there. Yeah, this is an ar uh, estate ardor. They are famous for their enormous bowls. Very neat. So a few questions. Uh, number one, where do you guys meet? And we win. meet at the Mix Sports Lounge, the third, sometimes fourth Tuesday of every month at cool. 7 o'clock in North Stafford. Very cool. Right next to Apply Harbor. Um, how would somebody, if they're interested, if somebody's interested out there, uh, join the club? Uh, the best way, in my opinion, is to show up. Just show up to a meeting. First meeting, we won't even like ask for any dues or fees or anything. You just show up see what it's like. That's how I joined. Uh, if you're already into it, you're already interested, you can go to the website. Uh, we can provide a link to that later. Uh, and just pay the membership dues there. Very cool. Very cool. How, how, much, how much are the membership dues? And how long uh, do they last? 16, I believe, at the beginning. Mm, no. 24 or 32, I believe it is. They last an entire year. So the 24 is, it might be less than 24 actually right now. I'm kind of overshooting and being generous. Mm -hmm. uh, the the lower price is for an individual, and the 50% more price is you can just bring a friend or significant other uh, whenever you want, and they and that includes just participating in everything the club has to offer. Uh, that's not additional costs. Uh, so you you'll get a glass out of it. You'll get like a taster glass. That's very cool. Should have brought one tonight, but. There's two different type types. There's a, like a mini snifter. It's like six ounces, mm -hmm. four to six ounces snifter, and a regular, just almost like mini pint glass, except it's four yeah, to six ounces. Little, little taster glasses, so you With, know. Yeah, it's got the logo etched in it and everything. I know uh, I've been to a few uh, homebrew club meetings from various clubs, and I know that they get together, and you know, you'll try, say, 20, 30 different homebrews. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest to anybody who's interested out there, Contact Mr. Kevin here and, uh, you know, get involved. Get involved in the homebrewing scene. It's a lot of fun. That's how I got started in the whole industry. Um, what uh, what have you brought for us tonight as far as homebrew? So I brought four different types. Uh, one is a, I'll start with a simple one. Uh, one is a Pater's beer. It's a, it's a beer that I just got kegged and, and bottled this weekend. Uh, it is a Belgian, it's probably more often known as a Belgian single, which is a very low alcohol Belgian, anywhere between four and 6%, mine's about five. Uh, but this is different than a single in that it's a darker, richer flavor, mm -hmm. but, oh, and it's also spiced with a little bit of cinnamon, but oh, wow. it's definitely lower in alcohol, but pub medium body. So I know, I know at, at Papa Hop, uh, I have a beer called Monk's Blood, and that has cinnamon into it, so that's kind of interesting. That's a good beer, yeah. It's, yeah. Also a uh, very impressive for an American brewed Belgian. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, well, that's that's really neat. And uh, okay, so we got that one. We got we got a stout. We got a milk stout. Uh, that's uh, about a four percent milk stout, uh, brewed with lactose. Milk stouts are called that for a reason. Uh, gives it a smoother body. Mine has some oats in it as well, giving it even more of a smoother, silky body. Uh, but it's a very just. Plain Jane milk stout. Mine's a little heavier in body because I typically prefer a drier beer, but mm -hmm. milk stouts I like to be a little on the heavy side to emphasize that smoothness and richness in the body. So absolutely, it's a pretty straightforward beer. Yeah. I really enjoy lacto, uh, you know, milk stout myself, yeah. and I look for that body. It's got to be a heavy, heavy body yeah. for me. Yeah, um, I would agree too that I like the drier beers. But yes, but yeah. So that's uh, that's the questions I got for you. And I uh, appreciate you coming out, man. We got two more beers, too. That is true. Which, which <laughs> are the other two? I'm sorry. Uh, the third one is a Belgian Dark Strong, which is, I didn't do the mash. The mash is done by Forge up in Lorton. Uh, it was going to be part of the last competition that we did. We do two competitions a year. Uh, but this one got canceled due to extraneous reasons of the brewery. Mm -hmm. um, and... It is a about eight to eight and a half percent uh, Belgian dark strong. It's really interesting because the the grain bill is a giant motley mix of different stuff. There's even rye in it. There's roasted barley, which you don't ever find in Belgium. 
Right. Uh, but that's something that Forge is famous for. They do some crazy matches in their grain builds and provides for some really interesting beer. Um, I did the, they did the mash, I did the brewing, and the hops. Or, I'm um, sorry, and the, the fermentation. Very neat. And the last one is something called a Grojiski or a Grotzer. It's a Polish beer. It's 100% oak smoked wheat. That's the only grain in it. But despite the name, it doesn't taste fruit like super fruity and super, you know, like what a typical wheat beer is. It's mm -hmm. a little more on the medium body to dry side, a little bitter, uh, definite smoke character. Mm -hmm. But oak is a lot less smoky than a lot of the other smoked type beers. That's another style that I don't see a lot of. No mainstream breweries doing. Yeah, I I've think uh, only New Belgium. Seen, yeah, I was just gonna say I've only seen one, and New Belgium has a Grotzer out there, and it's it's not a true Grotzer because they do use uh, midnight wheat and I think something else in it that's not smoked, but it's pretty decent. But I think they also throw in a little. Um, I think it was lacto in the, in the end of it. There was a little bit of sourness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I could uh, I could definitely pick up on that as well. Yeah, because it's it's in their Lips of Faith series. That's right, which is the sour series. But getting back to the homebrew club, um, I know too that when you guys get together, it's almost a brotherhood, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you, you guys do things also, I'm guessing, outside of brewing as well. We do. We we uh, we have several events throughout the year. I've only been going for about a year and a half, but the events that I've gone to is we did a July Fourth event at one person's in in a quiet harbor. Uh, we did a pouring of all our homebrews for the the, the citizens, the residents coming by. Uh, and gave them uh, any, we had about five, six kegs. We didn't get through them all. We brought a lot. Uh, that, that went really well. Uh, we've gone on a van tour of five different breweries in the DC area, including Atlas being one of them. Um, we did nice. pay for that, but if you're a member, you get a discount uh, about 50% less than everyone else did. So you guys do you guys do a lot of like pub crawls and that sort of thing as well. We're trying we're trying to. Uh, it's it's the logistics can be a little difficult sometimes, but we're we're definitely keeping it on the on the list of we're going to pursue this. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, very nice. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Hops, Beans, and Leaves. I'm sitting here with Clark. How are we doing? Doing great. Great, uh, Mr. Kevin Benedict, the uh, VP of Stafford Homebrew Club. Hogan, as always, a pleasure. Thanks, guys. And I just met you. I'm sorry. I'm Ben. 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 So, how are you guys doing tonight? Everybody doing well? Yeah, good. good. Doing yeah. great. We're getting ready to uh, try some homebrew. So, Kevin, take it away. All right. So, the first thing I feel like would be wise flavor-wise would be the Pater's beer, which is a Belgian, it's similar to a Belgian single. Uh, it's been, it's a little darker, a little, little heavier in body. And it is slightly spiced with cinnamon. Not sure how noticeable that's going to be, but we will find out. Thank you, Clark. This is a this is a new style for me to brew. But I read about it and it just sounded great, and the way they marketed it sounded great. Got a nice clarity to it. Now, what would be an off the shelf? Similar to this, there just really is there is not. Uh, so the flavor is, in my opinion, is a little more like a Belgian double, but the strength and body is a little closer to a single. Okay. So I'd say like a Hardywood single or a um, one of the Belgian doubles. There's got a uh, Belgian combination between the two. Today. It's very light, very drinkable, and not overpowering. Ooh. That's nice. What's the ABV? Uh, around five percent. I didn't okay. unfortunately memorize in both numbers the before and after. So the way you test is you, it's a gravity measurement, the density, and it's that reveals how much sugar is before and how much sugar is after. Gotcha. But it did come out to the approximate. About five percent. Give or take five percent. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the monks used to brew this for their own consumption yes. while they're brewing the, the doubles and the triples. Yeah, it was known as a, a well, the article I read called it their lawnmower beer, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was their it was their I was about to say their bud. That's a, just a bad comparison. <laughs> uh, hey, no, so no, 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 no. <laughs> we're not going there tonight. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, but yeah, that, that's, this is a, uh, it was marketed as their, you know, they, they can't always be drinking their triples and quads when they're doing their religious monthly duties, because uh, especially if they were fasting or something, a solid fast, that would 
probably mess them up quite a bit. So they want to fall over they the will, pews and everything else. Exactly. Else. So they'll they'll drink something much much lighter. That's well made though, man. I mean, I'm really enjoying that. Thanks. It's got a nice uh, caramel quality to it. Yeah. I feel like if I did it next time, I'd throw a little more cinnamon in. I want I want personally, I'd like it to be a little more noticeable. But yeah, it still turned out well. Now, for someone that doesn't brew beer, never never homebrew. What's a, what's typically a starter in the homebrew field? Like, what do people get started with? What's well, the first method you get started with is called extract brewing. Uh, as for the beer styles, I mean, it can really be anything. My first style was a pilsner, uh, which was a horrible way to go. Um, <laughs> pilsners are the, pretty much the hardest beers, almost the hardest beer to brew. Um, but typically, they'd start with a pale ale or a brown ale or something like that, just because they're very forgiving. You know, if you mess up on a brown ale, like brown ales are pretty, pretty, you know, it's a brown ale. They're just a little malty, a little rosy, not much to it. Um, uh, actually, a buddy of mine, he just got into home brewing, and he uh, bought an extract kit, and he did buy a honey brown. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, and Steven, if you're watching, I'm talking about you. <laughs> um, he uh, ended up putting in secondary and then putting marshmallow and graham cracker in it. Ooh. And it turned out phenomenal. Uh, yeah, that sounds so, awesome. Yeah. Steven Matters, if you're out there, yeah, I just give you a shout out, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's see. So extract brewing. Extract brewing is, it skips a lot of the process I'll talk about a little later. Uh, it skips the mash, skip, skips a lot, basically the entire mashing process. So you go straight to the boil, which is where you throw in this extract. Sometimes you can use some grains to soak it as you're bringing it up to heat, giving it a little extra flavor, like if you're doing a stout or something, you know, throw in some roasted grains or some what's called chocolate grains. Uh, and the extract itself is what's providing the fermentables. It's providing all the sugar, the maltose specifically, all the sugars that you're going to boil with the hops. And, you know, all that gets broken up and uh, the sugars are more simplified after a mash and then after a boil. So the yeast have an easier time eating them. Okay. So, so it's basically like one of those box cakes that you get. It's got all the ingredients in it. <laughs> yes. You yeah, just yeah. kind of... So follow you'll see, the instructions on the box. And yeah. So when you get the when you get the extract, you get you'll find uh, like there's two different forms. There's liquid extract. There's salt. There's um, what they call DME, dry malt extract. Uh, there's not really. It's not really a yes or no. Like which one should I use? Which one's better? That's not really the right question. Uh, they kind of. That you you do some googling on that, and you'll find opinions all over the map. Uh, but typically. The dry malt is a little more deficient, but it's going to cost you a little more. So you know, yeah, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the dry malt's just obviously because it's not liquid; it's condensed down even more until it's a solid powder. I mean, and this stuff is really a powder. It's like you know, baby powder. You get, it, it gets you know, you open the bag, just getting it exposed to a little moisture in the air, you'll start to see it solidify around the edges of the bag. It, get, it gotcha. grabs onto liquid instantly. Um, so that yeah, that's that's extract brewing. You just dump it in the boil, throw the hops in, and you're well beyond up. that at this point. You're doing yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do the full boil and mash, and that and a big, big, uh, big setup of, of. I have something called a Herm system, a heat exchange system for the mash. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, well, it's you, it's you a mod, it's a Frankenstein that keeps growing. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, like a pilot system going. On. Yes, basically. Very nice. Uh, very nice. Yes, yeah, so you it's got a big Frankenstein setup. <laughs> you, you've got the Breaking Bad set up before yeah. you got the warehouse. So when I was making I that milk you. stout a while back, I, I was looking at everything in my kitchen. I'm like, man, this just looks like a drug lab or something. There's white powder <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, there's, it's, yeah he's, he's been there on a brood a few times. Like, There's just powder and drug. It looks like drugs and vials and everything it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Add this white powder here. So on a scale of one to five, five being hard. Where would you place this particular beer that we just tried? Uh, well, I did do, there is a, for most recipes, you can find an a extract uh, alternative. Any any all grain version is going to be more difficult because you need the extra equipment. For the yeah. But uh, this, I would actually say, is fairly simple. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, it's just a straight up, especially Great with beer, extract, just straight up boil, straight up, you know, add cinnamon at the end. Next time, I'll probably add cinnamon in the secondary fermenter as well, to kind of like cold, Cold brewing coffee. 
Like it's, okay. It soaks yep. in all the flavor, but it doesn't bring out any of the harshness. So. That, that's kind of the nice thing about home brewing, I think, is anybody can pick it up and you can go as far with it as you want or, yeah. you know, make it yeah. as hard as you want it to be or as simple as you want it to be. Or as simple. Yeah. 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 You know? How do you, how do you uh, uh, control for quality in terms of your products, uh, like the, the hops and the, and the, and the wheat? Yeah, the so, grain so uh, grain, they say grain uh, you typically want to use within a year of buying or it's going to get stale. Uh, it, you'll, you know, it might still be, you might still get efficiency uh, out of the, from the, like, during the mashing process, the converting of the starches to the sugars. Uh, but over time, you're going to lose some quality and flavor, just like anything going stale. I try to keep everything airtight uh, if I'm not going to use it for a while. Uh, I try to buy fresh, fresh grain, but honestly, I have a lot of grain built up at home right now. I really should just <laughs> think of some experimental recipes and just do them. Just get get rid of the grain. Just sacks and sacks of grain up yet. Yes. yes. Silo. Sacks well, I don't I don't mass buy <laughs> grain yet. Uh, yeah, I get a silo. That, that would definitely. What about the hops? Do you do? I know like uh, a few of my friends they'll. Package them, they'll, they'll suck the you know, vacuum pack them and then stick them in the, the freezer. That'll yeah, I got one of those food savers just for grain and hops. So if I open a bag of hops and I don't use it all, or if a bag of grain I don't use it all, I will usually, I'm not feeling too lazy, I will usually take it, vacuum seal it, uh, and throw it in the freezer. Not the grain, the, the hops you throw in the freezer. Okay. When you freeze them, the, sh the shelf life becomes much longer mm -hmm. than it ever was before. So. Gotcha. And they keep backing that up. The more they've done experiments testing that, it keeps being proven true. So. From a uh, from a homebrew standpoint, is it tough to get hop? Because I know there's hop shortages all over the place. So is that something that you're running into the homebrew? Uh, I've been brewing for about three years now, and I've, I've noticed a couple different varieties, depending on when you buy them during the year, can be quite expensive as opposed to even, even some of the no, basic noble hops that you'll find in Pilsners or uh, basic lagers. One in particular called Czech Saz. When I first started brewing, I was apparently it was in abundance. I was finding it for about a dollar an ounce. Now sometimes I see it for like two two fifty an ounce. Like that's that's a 200, 250 percent markup. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just sometimes so the yield every year is so different. We've talked about white powder, a crazy brand tonight. <laughs> now we're talking about ounces. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> He lives. Well, here's, here's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. We got three more beers to try. We do. We do. What do we have? Three All right. So talk us through some of these. Next, I think we'll move to to the milk stout. Not uh, that I want another beer right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is well, a limited show, so yeah. Beer. Absolutely. So this, uh, I, let's go around the table. Uh, so Thank this you, is. So it's well. First of all, I have to emphasize: Is anyone lactose intolerant? Yeah, because if so, you're gonna use the toilet real quick. Yeah. So it is a milk stout. It is brewed with lactose. I'm just doing small pours because we have two more beers here. Uh, and uh, also, if you're allergic to pumpkin, I'll explain this in a minute. If you're allergic to pumpkin, you probably shouldn't drink this particular beer. It was originally supposed to be a pumpkin milk stout, and I used, which I'll never do again, I, I used a pumpkin puree in the fermenter, and apparently no pumpkin flavor gets transferred. Did it get stuck uh, and in I the, even used it in the mash. Did it get stuck in the vacuum system again? No. no. <laughs> I actually did a pumpkin beer one time, and I took the pumpkin and just cut it in quarters, put it in the oven. I knew you were going to say that. Yes. And yeah, yeah. And, uh, definitely doing that next time. Uh, I, uh, there is this there's this uh, guy in our, our homebrew club who doesn't really get to make it that often anymore, but Jamie Gray, this is a shout out to you. Um, he His... His flavor beers are some of the best beers I've ever had uh, of any flavor beer. His homebrewed flavor beers, they, they're just phenomenal. And he had a he had a pumpkin stout um, that was just out of this world. I couldn't believe that. I said, so where, did you, how many steps in the process did you do the, do the pumpkin? He said, only the mash. I'm like, there's no way. Like, no way. You had done it in mash, boil, primary, and secondary, because there's so much pumpkin flavor. He's like, no, I just roasted it and chopped it up in small to medium pieces and roasted it and threw it in the mash. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I did not do that. So. But you can definitely get some uh, nutmeg and those sort of holiday spices in this. It's yeah, really it's just a little bit in there. Just a little bit. Just to, because I did, I wanted to focus, a lot of pumpkin beers, in my opinion, focus more on the pumpkin spice than they do the pumpkin. Yeah. So, like, I, I don't want a pumpkin spice beer. I want a pumpkin beer. Well done. It's Thank that you. whole white girls. 
pumpkin spice latte <laughs> movement. Yeah, the whole, uh, I, I know a couple people on Facebook, every year when it rolls around, they're just like, no, it's going to affect everything I'm eating and drinking now. Pumpkin everywhere. <laughs> but it's good marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Marketing at its best. So, well, since we're all drinking this one, I guess I could talk about the more complicated version of brewing. Yeah, you know, go for it. All, all grain. Um, you know, eventually, if, if you stay in it long enough, I mean, some people will stay with extract the whole time they're brewing, you know, for decades maybe. Uh, but most people will move to all grain. And the reason for that is not because you can make better or worse beer. You can make really good beer with extract. Um, the, the reason they do that, I believe, and the reason I did it, because you have a lot more freedom in what you're doing. It's kind of like uh, you can I'm trying to think of any coffee equivalent. It's like you can you can have a good cup of coffee, but until you like really start exploring all the different methods of temperature control and how fast you're pouring it or pressure, you know, until you start introducing these other variables, yeah, you can make really good stuff. But it's like taking the training wheels off. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, the standard a is a French press, but then when you get into the siphon press, and that, right. all of these expensive, uh, also looks like a drum lab. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I had a siphon press. Basically, it all comes room. down to, if it's fun, it probably came out of something that looks like a drum lab. Yeah. Whether it was or not, <laughs> that's what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This uh, is good. Thank you. What's the alcohol on this one. This is about four. It might even be less because it didn't ferment as much as I thought it did or I thought it was going to, but I did get a little extra out of it. Uh, so it's drinkable it's, without getting snookered. Exactly. Like it tastes heavy bodied and it, like it would have more, but it's the lightest beer here. Nice. I know that a lot of customers come in, they'll ask, if, you know, if we get to talking about homebrew, they ask like when, when I put it in the carboy, how long should it ferment for? So how long should that bubbler be bubbling? How long should that airlock be bubbling? That depends on several factors. That depends, first of all, on how on how strong, that's the wrong word, how much sugar is in the beer. Mm -hmm. okay. It also depends on your fermentation temperature and what yeast, what style of yeast you're using. It probably depends at least on what style of yeast you're using, but if you're lagering, it's going to take probably twice as long at least. Uh, but for, let's let's say you're doing like a 5% pale ale, I, Personally, I mean, I've read things where people take it out after five days. I usually like to give everything at least two weeks, but the bubbling itself for something that week might only happen for the first three or four days, mm -hmm. and that's done. Um, you could, as soon as that it, the foam is called Krausen, as soon as the Krausen settles and it sinks back in, you're pretty much done. Like, it's not fermenting anymore. Um, if you're trying to get it drier, what you would do is ramp up the temperature, but that's, that's more like you have to have ways to temperature control. Uh, but yeah, it, so you, let's, let's say you're doing an imperial stout that's like 10%. You know, the, you need to give that a couple weeks. Like that, you know, it might even look like it finishes, but it's not. It's still going. This one, I had a, I had, or, sorry, not, yeah, the Pater's beer. That one started to settle to, and I did a gra gravity measurement. Like that is not as dry as it should be. Uh, so I brought it upstairs and uh, I brought the fermenter up to the top level of my house and set the thermostat to 71, I believe. And it says, you know, normally it's set to sink during the winters when I'm at work. I'm like, no, I'm just going to leave it a week at 71 and let it go. And I got another, what's called gra gravity, I got, for those who are listening, I got another 0 .005 down out of it, which is pretty much what I was shooting for. Um, that's, that number is a, is a gravity number. And I could start. I could start rabbit trailing here on all that. But <laughs> the gravity measurements, working components. Yeah, right gravity measurements and how that works and how to do the math on how to calculate ABV very easily Googleable. Googleable. So, so there you go, viewers. Can you bang it? Though? Can you? I think you can bang it. I just. Right. I'm not a binger. We, I don't. I don't, I don't bang. Well, we don't necessarily trust bang. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we only have a few minutes left, but let's let's try these other yeah. beers and talk through them. And I think we got what? We got two more. Mm -hmm. Yep, two more. So, what do we got? We'll do a little bit of the Belgian Dark Strong. This is the one that Atlas did the mash for. I'm saving the smoked beer for last because it's a very unique flavor that might color anything we have after that. So, this is a you know, pretty crazy grain build that they that they gave us. Uh, it is a... Uh, it, the, 
half the base malt, the bit so base malt and all grain is where you get most of your fermentables because the heavily roasted grains are so heavily roasted that you can't really get much uh, sugar out of them. Kind of like if you caramelize something, you know, the sugar is pretty much gone. Like, or it's burned, so it's damaged. It's got a um, complex flavor for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So their their grain bill had half the half of the base malt was an English grain called Maris Otter. For those of you who are homebrewers and all grain know know what that is. The other half was a Belgian Pilsner, which is what all Belgians typically use in their base malt. Uh, so you know, it's kind of like half English malty, half Belgian already. And then there's they threw in some rye, some roasted barley, some crystal malt, which is pretty typical, and um, can't remember the other one. But yeah, it was it was really complex grain bill. Like I'm reading it, this was for the competition. I'm like rye roasted, what am I in Bel What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> and like one one guy used a, a wheat yeast, uh, one or Belgian wheat. One I use. Uh, so most people use the Belgian. Uh, I can't, there was one, I can't remember what, oh, it was an English ES, ESB yeast, uh, which is a pretty good, pretty good idea, too. That actually turned out really well. Uh, but yeah, this, I used a, a, the same yeast, if you're familiar with the, not, not Rochefort, um, the other Trapposphere, Westmall. I use Westmall's yeast, which is okay. commercially available. It just goes by a different name. I like this one. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, this turned out, this turned out pretty well. Oh, candy sugar and that sort of thing going on. I did throw in candy sugar. Okay. Yes, I used a pound of the dark, the dark candy syrup, which is beet sugar, apparently. That's all it is. Yeah, it's candy sugar yeah. made from beets. Mm -hmm. That's what gives the dark Belgian and some of the triples their, their rich sweetness. Rich sweetness, yeah. Me personally, I'm a big but it's uh, not over Belgian beer fan. So. Right. You're a Belgian? I love Belgian beers. Oh, yeah. So. I appreciate you bringing that one out. That one is tasty. Mm -hmm. They're all tasty, but I like that one. Do we have a bottle of them? I do. Excellent. So this one is going to be possibly hit or miss, although because we all smoke and hear cigars or pipes, uh, I have a feeling we're all going to like it. Um, it's definitely, I mean, I have another one if we don't have enough. Uh, <laughs> so this so one, for those of you that are at home, it's okay. We're still drinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun night here at uh, Hogshead Cigar Lounge. So this one is uh, supposed the style. It was recently rediscovered um, in Poland by by a researcher named Stan Hieronymus, who also wrote a book called How to Brew Like a Monk, specializing in Belgian beers. Has almost a urine taste. So I got I got to show the viewers. Don't say that. Taste. I got to show that. the viewers. <laughs> what? No. I mean, it's just got one no. heck of no, a head the retention right malt. there. Yeah, that's the smoke malt. Yeah, yeah but you, you know the taste. Now that you, you know the smell, that, that, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. necessarily the taste, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, to stand. So to stand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very. So it's it's good. good. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. good. So it's a. It's wow. a. That's it is good. all 100% really oak smoked wheat. You can pick this grain up at, uh, they actually sell it at the brew shop. Uh, I, I, my first, this is one of the few beers where I've done two batches of it at different times. Normally I like to try to brew things I've never brewed before, but some things I just like are so unique or so weird. I, I like really weird beers. I like to, like that looks weird and challenging, I want to brew it. And it doesn't, it uh, doesn't yeah, elevate like, your urine taste at no, all. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> So this was discovered. Uh, Poland, <coughs> their, their water is very hard water. I typically oh, add a lot of minerals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first batch I added a lot of minerals. This one I added less. I also pulled back the grain a little bit because it is supposed to be weak in alcohol. This one's about 5% as well. Their versions can be like between 3 and 6. Uh, so it's like, I like it a little stronger than 3 or 4. Uh, and I use it, you're supposed to use a Polish uh, yeast, but there aren't any on the market that I know of, so I use a German yeast instead. It's okay. It's, 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 it's close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's geographically too, close. Too soon? <laughs> I wasn't a lot. Hey, America is the mixing pot. It is. There we go. It is, for sure. Uh, but the, so the smoke beer, <laughs> the Germans if, if you ever had a, a Rausch beer or a Rauch beer, however you pronounce it, uh, 
you'll know that a route beer is even smokier than this, but they use much less smoked malt than this uses. This is all oak smoked wheat, and that's the difference, is that they use oak to smoke it. Oak is a very mild smoke flavor compared to, you know, beechwood or hickory or some of the ones that these other brands can use. I like that smoked flavor, though. The oh, thing I like about this style rather than a rock beer is that those can get a little meaty. They can taste a little yes, beefy or bacony. Or and my first version of this was kind of bacony. What's funny is that a lot of people, they're like, when are you going to brew that bacon beer again? Like, uh, <laughs> it's not even supposed to taste like that. See, I tried a mesquite smoked beer at your place. Yes. yes. That was... I mean, that I was drank brown ale. that much of it, and that was all I wanted to try. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas some this, customers came in, and they just kept getting growl pills of it, because they enjoy it with certain foods. Yeah. This, I really like the smoke flavor. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not yeah, an no. overbearing, like... Smoke beer is definitely not for everybody, that's for sure. It's a very unique flavor. I like this one. Was your wee heavy beer that you made with the peat with that? That was, yeah, so the peat, I had brewed a wee heavy with, I, I want to throw some peat and malt in there to actually make it seem scotch, like like a scotch. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how strong and overpowering peat was. This is 100% <laughs> smoked malt. The wee heavy was 5% peated malt, and it was three times overpowering as this is. It, wow. was, it was wonderful. But it was really good. I mean, it actually was really good. But it if, like if, people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if people don't like scotch, they would hate that beer. But, uh, you know, we did some pours at Spencer Devon, and there was one lady that, the, the most unlikely person, just this, like, sweet, not not old lady, but, like, the sweet older lady, just come, she just kept coming up the floor. She just, she's like, could you give me more of that? that it wasn't Doris Buffett. <laughs> it was like, wow. I don't, I don't know who it was. Because Doris Buffett loves a good scotch, and it wouldn't surprise me if, that was her yeah, time of been, I mean, so. if she's a local to a lot of pub areas, it might have been her. She seemed like she knew what she was she doing lives there. a block from there, so it oh, wouldn't yeah. surprise me. Yeah. Well, I guess it's time to wrap up the show. Absolutely. Kevin, thank you for coming out. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And great job. Great ben, ben, nice to meet nice you. Times. Thank you guys ben. for watching. Another episode of Hot Beans and Leaves. We'll see you next week. Cheers. See you guys.